question. I'm Sebastian. As you just heard, uh, I'm a researcher at the University of Oxford. And I'm presenting today our experiments or our evaluation of wireless attacks against electric vehicle charging. Um, this work I've actually presented yesterday. Um, so for those who weren't able to make it to my talk, um, I'll just give a short introduction to the topic, um, what kind of electric vehicle charging and so on. Um, and the paper was uh, joint work with my colleagues from Oxford, um, Richard Baker, um, a colleague from Arma Swiss Science and Technology, um, Martin Strohmeyer, and my supervisor, Ivan Martinovich from Oxford. So we all know electric vehicles are everywhere. And there are actually um, a growing number of electric vehicles every day. And that's why we need charging parks like the one shown here. Uh, where in this uh, specific example, I mean, back in December 2021, um, ENBW Germany claimed this is the largest uh, charging hub in Europe and you can charge 52 electric vehicles uh, simultaneously. Um, but we also see um, immobility in other areas. So for example, electric trucks, um, this is just one example. It's kind of like the exact uh, same charging station we saw on the, uh, on the photo before. Um, but there are also buses they are now fully electric. Uh, this is also in Germany, a uh, bus depot in Hamburg, and all these buses are fully electric. And I'm gonna try to, I don't know if this works, but they're basically the charging cables just hanging down from the top. It's like blue charging cables, it's hard to see. Um, but yeah, all of these buses are fully electric and they need to be charged during the night. And just another example, this is a ferry in Bangkok and it, it uses 28 charging cables simultaneously. Uh, so that's actually quite funny. Um, I imagine it takes quite a while to plug them in and then just unplug them again. Um, and so each of these uh, charging cables can usually handle around like 100 kilowatts at least. And so there's a, a lot of actually power going through these cables. Um, and then we, we see uh, mining equipment getting electrified now. So ABB uh, now advertises they want to make uh, mining greener. And so imagine like all these vehicles will be fully electric. So why did I show you all these photos? Well, they have one thing in common. They all use the same charging standard, which is known as the combined charging system. Um, so the ferry we just saw has basically 28 of these uh, plugs or sockets. So what is a, char a combined charging system or short CCS? Uh, it's a DC fast charging standard. So um, rapid charging in, in other words, uh, it's when you, you want to drive somewhere and you need to quickly charge. This is when you use DC rapid charging. And there are two different plug types. So the one on the left, uh, which is the combo one, uh, it's mainly used in the US or North America. And on the right, you can see uh, the combo two, which is mainly used in Europe. and South Korea, for example, uh, they use exactly the same technology. It's it's exactly the same um, technology underlying these uh, plug types. It's just a different plug. Um, and I don't know exactly why the plug is different, but yeah, it uses uh, same communication. And yeah, as you can see, DC in the bottom. So why do we care about CCS? What is so important about this uh, charging communication, or uh, this charging type? And Imagine you're charging your vehicle, right? You plug it in and it charges. Actually, there is a continuous communication going on between the vehicle and the charger. So for example, the vehicle tells the charger um, the current state of charge, battery temperature, how much voltage it needs, how much current, and so on. Um, so this communication is actually quite crucial for the safety of this charging communication. And previous research has looked into uh, what what can we do with this like communication? And my colleague uh, Richard found out that actually the technology used for this communication, uh, which is called power line communication, you might know power line communication from these small little adapters you can buy for home use. You plug them in one room and connect your Ethernet to your router, and then you get internet into another room. Uh, this is exactly the same technology used in in this charging standard. And Richard found out that actually this provides uh, a high quality, uniquely, um, uniquely high quality unintentional wireless channel because the charging cable is unshielded and it is an antenna. So you can just observe the electromagnetic waves as shown here in the frequency domain. 
so yeah these uh this is the signal just radiating from from the charging cable so based on this we were wondering can you actually do more i mean we can receive the signal from the charging cable it's an antenna so usually an antenna if it can emit a signal it can also receive yeah so we we're wondering can we actually inject and disrupt a communication you could do this uh, for different um, reasons uh, for example to disrupt an individual vehicle um, I don't know who has an electric vehicle in here but sometimes you you need to charge you want to go to the supermarket let's say and you arrive and someone is already charging um, wouldn't it be great if you could just disrupt the charging unplug the cable and plug your uh, car in well this could be one motivation to just inter uh, interfere with the ongoing charging another reason could be fleet denial and actually blackmail someone. So in the UK, in Oxford, there, there is DPD, a parcel delivery uh, company, and they have a fully electric fleet. I don't know how many uh, vans they have. I think between 40 and 60. All of them are fully electric, and I imagine they can't charge because someone is blocking the charging. So they would uh, lose quite a lot of money. And in my opinion, actually, the most severe um, problem here is if someone disrupts a lot of chargers at the same time on a on the large scale let's say um all chargers in california for example uh, which could cause um, great instabilities because suddenly if the charging is interrupted um the power grid um basically uh, loses a lot of um a lot of usage and it takes some time to adapt so we can get some frequency instabilities based on some uh, work uh, richard did we know that uh, we can receive using off-the-shelf equipment, so we can also probably inject using off-the-shelf equipment. And you don't really need a lot of knowledge about um, the, the digital signal processing. Just, uh, I mean, you need to know the basics, you need to know how to use software-defined radio, and I mean, we'll talk about a bit our experimental setup uh, in the next few slides, and you will realize it's actually quite easy to do this yourself. So. We, we looked at the standard, we looked at what communication is going on, what um, medium access control is used, and we found out the, uh, the charger and the car both use uh, which, what is called carrier sense multiple access collision avoidance, or in short, CSMACA. So just to give you a brief introduction what the CSMACA is, just in case you're not familiar with it, if you have two nodes communicating and they wouldn't have this medium access control mechanism, they would just send messages. And if they sent at some point a message at the same time, it would cause a collision. So uh, none of the clients would be able to actually receive the, uh, the message and demodulate it and decode it. So to prevent this, um, this medium access control mechanism is in implemented which senses the medium first. So let's say the car wants to send a message to the charger. The car then checks, is actually the medium clear to send? Is someone already transmitting? No? Great, I can just send my message. Same for the charger. Is it clear to send? Yes? Okay. However, in the case it is not clear, um, the car backs off, which means it waits for a random amount of time, checks the medium again, and if it's free, it sends the message. So this is just to avoid collisions. So the question is, how do we know if the medium is busy or not? Um, oh wait, sorry, let me just yeah show you this uh, slide. Uh, actually, if you can exploit this, uh, this mechanism, so imagine someone is telling the car and the charger all the time, I'm communicating. So here we have uh, CSMACA up, uh, ongoing under normal operation. And then suddenly we have an attacker who just makes the the medium look busy. So at some point, a timeout occurs because no one is sending any messages, right? Because they are backing off, they're waiting for the medium to become clear to send their message. Um, so the question is, how do we know if the medium is busy? Well, the standard defines that actually, if we detect the preamble, which is 2 dB above noise, then there is a communication ongoing. So all we need to do is we need to um, inject preambles. This was our hypothesis. And then we know, basically, based on previous work, uh, that we have this high-quality antenna, 
um, that we can inject. So we ask ourselves the question, can we actually, let me just, this. sorry. I don't know why it's jumping, but anyways, we ask us uh, the question, um, can we disrupt um, an ongoing communication by exploiting this 2 dB above noise and uh, the unshielded charging cable. So now I'm going to talk a bit more about the experiment. Um, so we, to do this, we actually wanted to have a setup which is realistic. Um, so we got some some uh, home plug green fire, that's the PLC technology modems, which you can see here. And this was the first challenge actually we uh, we had. Getting those boards is not that easy because we are not a car manufacturer, we are a university. So we tried to buy those and the question was, how many do you need? How many thousands? Uh, we said, um, well, two. Um, so they actually refused to sell them to us. And this was the first challenge, right? I mean, we heard earlier um, setting up test beds and doing experiments and um, making it accessible or publicly accessible for um, researchers. I mean, this would be great because if someone would have such a test bed and everyone could just try their experiments on this, this would be amazing. Otherwise, you might struggle or you might not be able to do any experiments because you can't get the hardware. Uh, luckily, our partner, uh, Amaswiss, was able to, to get these boards for us and we were actually able to run the experiments. So we connected um, a Raspberry Pi to each of the boards, which is kind of uh, our vehicle and then our charging station. And we just ran a UDP communication between those two via the charging cable. So um, we used iPerf, uh, we set up iPerf server on one of the Raspberry Pis, iPerf client on the other, uh, had a continuous um, communication. And then we just tried if we can detect this communication. So our mo method was uh, as follows. Uh, as I just said, we set up this UDP um, transmission between two Raspberry Pis that were connected via PLC modems. And we observed a 0% packet loss without an attacker, right? Because they don't back off, they're, they're just happily communicating. Um, but at some point, we expected that if we inject this like signal, the preamble, that the nodes will pick this up and think, oh, someone is communicating. So we just uh, started emitting these preambles to reduce the throughput and increase the packet loss. By slowly increasing the output power, so which means we transmit um, on a higher output power, so we increase the likelihood of the preamble actually being picked up by the charging cable or the antenna. Uh, we increase um, the, uh, the, the number of successfully injected preambles and also at the same time reduce um, the, the throughput because the, the modems now back off more frequently. And we did this basically until the nodes stopped communicating completely and we reached a packet loss of 100%. And we could uh, see this quite easily on, on the Raspberry Pis where we had the iPerf, where we had iPerf set up that we basically got uh, no route to host. It was just not able to send any data. And as soon as we stopped uh, emitting the preamble so the uh, nodes could continue communicating, uh, it immediately um, continued. And so we did these experiments actually in different, for different distances. And we measured uh, what transmission power we will need um, to attack the system for a given distance. We also repeated the experiments multiple times um, to ensure that we actually take into consideration the uncontrollable environmental factors because since it's power line communication and we know the charging cable is, um, is an antenna, even noise we didn't emit gets also picked up by the antenna, right? So let's assume you have a noisy PC plugged in somewhere on the floor above you, uh, it could be it couples onto the charging cable that increases the noise floor. And this is, um, is a problem because we need to inject the signal which is 2 dB above noise. So if the noise floor is higher, we need to inject uh, a stronger signal. So we had to run this experiment multiple times to make sure we, we actually account for these, um, these uh, factors. So this is where we ran some tests. Um, and I would like to point out that this was uh, at the university. This is not the shielded room, this is our social area. Um, but since we transmitted only with uh, a power of five to 10 milliwatts, this is not an issue. I mean, comparing it to how much the power line adapters, if you plug them into the wall, 
if you use them for home communication, they communicate with like 100, 200 milliwatts and we uh, only did 10 milliwatts. So we didn't disrupt or interfere with anything um, or not more than uh, a broken uh, home plug green fire adapter would do, for example. But yeah, so we had these adapters I just showed you uh, here at the end. Uh, we had our attacker set up um, down here, uh, antenna, uh, our software defined radio, so it's just a transmitter, uh, small amplifier, and yeah, and we just emitted the signal and measured how far we can go. And we we realized, okay, this is working extremely well. Um, as I just said, uh, below 10 milliwatt, we were able to disrupt the charging or the, this UDP communication. I mean, we're still not talking actually about charging. It's just a communication using the same technology, underlying physical layer technology uh, that uh, the combined charging system uses. We were able to disrupt this easily from 10 meters away. Um, but yeah, there, there were a few takeaways. And if someone of you, I don't know who is working on physical layer security here uh, and wireless security, but there, there were a few takeaways um, I would like to just talk about. And um, if you're interested in this area of work, um, Hap would be happy to have a discussion about this. So the first, um, I've already mentioned it, is actually getting access to specialized equipment can be very difficult. Um, we we tried to get these adapters, we couldn't get them, and it, it took quite a while to finally source them. And uh, so, yeah, having collaborations and working with people together uh, might help here. Um, uncontrollable environmental factors uh, might influence the results, as I mentioned for PLC in particular, uh, this is a problem, and you just need to be need to be aware of this. You need to rerun the experiment multiple times, different days. We run it on the weekend because you can actually uh, tell if um, if we ran some experiments during the week when the building was busy and there were loads of people. Um, you you could see the noise flow on the wires was actually higher compared to on the weekend. So we ran uh, during the night, we ran during the day. Um, yeah, just multiple runs. Um, one interesting one is actually um, the transmission power of the software-defined radio we used uh, differed depending on the laptop it was connected to. So we, uh, of course, um, connected the equipment to um, some measurement equipment and we measured the output power to be able to uh, actually say exactly how much output power we needed to disrupt. Uh, but then just used another lap laptop because the other one, the battery ran out or whatever the reason was, and then realized the numbers didn't match up. And it was just different laptop, and suddenly we got um, 3, 4 dBm less output power, and that's quite a lot. Um, so you need to be aware of this. Uh, we then just started only using one laptop, and we did loads of measurements, actually, where we had the laptop connected to, um, to a power supply, uh, running on battery and checked if if there is a difference between the output power um, just to make sure that our experiments we ran over the last couple of uh, days weren't actually wrong or or different. Another uh, crucial aspect is actually the software you're running. So um, again, we had two laptops. Luckily, they were on exactly the same um, software stack because we use Docker. It makes it easy to deploy. We have our Docker container. Once we have um, our Docker compose file and Docker file, we just run it and we know we have exactly the same same environment on all of the devices, so that's great. But um, initially, not even for this project, but so we were already aware of this issue, but we, we realized uh, you use uh, SOAPI SDR version 3 and SOAPI SDR version 3.1 and you suddenly have a different output power for some reason. Um, don't know what what's going on under the under the hood. We haven't actually reverse engineered or looked through the source code. But so yeah, um, just important to to have the same software environment as well all the time. So that's why we use Docker. Um, and yeah, another interesting one specifically for PLC and our experiments was um, if you do experiments and you want to test how your signal is actually coupling onto the PLC and how effective it is. Um, and we got one comment from the reviewers uh, when we submitted uh, to NDSS. And the question was about the point of entry of the EMI signal. And we 
Uh, it's a valid question because uh, it could be that the signal is actually not coupling onto your charging cable, but onto power lines running in the wall and then cross talking onto why like the, the power supply onto the board into the PLC chip. So we run everything on batteries to make sure we actually don't have this cross talk between our uh, equipment and then power lines and so on. Um, so yeah, after running these experiments in the lab, we were of course keen to test this on real equipment and real hardware and chargers. So we put everything in the back of a car. Um, again, you can see the antenna, it's just a bunch of wires, uh, software defined radio, uh, amplifier and our power supply. And um, yeah, we wanted to do exactly the same we did in the lab. So we followed the same, the same method. The problem was the charger and the vehicle, in this case, th these are black boxes for us. While using the Raspberry Pis in the lab, we could just SSH into and we could see, okay, packet loss. We can see like um, the bandwidth is reduced or the throughput is reduced and we can already see an effect of the attack. For the charging station, for the vehicle, we couldn't because there was no interface. We just tried it and either it works or, or it doesn't. Um, but we followed the similar method as uh, in the lab. So we just increased the output power or transmission power until we could see some effect. Um, yeah, until the charging stopped. And we evaluated the same vehicle multiple times because in the controlled lab environment, we had this, okay, well, here's um, the setup and here's the attacker and we increase distance. But in the, in the real world environment, it's a bit different, right? You have loads of things affecting um, your signal propagation. You have multiple chargers, you have um, some buildings, some walls, the signal, you have multipath and whatsoever. So uh, you need to, to run multiple experiments, um, tests on multiple chargers because uh, it could be, is it the car that is vulnerable? Is it the charger? Is it both? So um, we try to run multiple um, combinations and also a different state of charge because uh, as you might know, uh, running or charging your vehicle Actually, once you reach like 80%, uh, the power going through um, or the charging uh, power is reduced, it's getting um, lower. So we wanted to know if this affects the attack. So we also had to uh, drive around, run down the battery to, I don't know, 10%, try it and try it with like 90% of state of charge. Um, yeah, and as I just mentioned, um, different settings, so distance, angles, antenna alignment. So we had the antenna, for example, just as you saw in the previous photo, in the back of the car, we put the uh, antenna outside. We actually uh, put the antenna on the side of the uh, car and tried uh, a drive-by attack, which means we just drive around and check if the, the charger still dis uh, is disrupted or the charging. And again, we repeated the experiments multiple times because even there it, it changes, right? Um, might be there is some noise which makes the attack suddenly harder, uh, but as soon as this uh, noise source is gone, it, it's, it's easier again. Um, we tested different vehicles. So in total eight vehicles, we, we said we are not gonna reveal which uh, manufacturers um, we tested just because it's a standards issue. It's not the problem with an individual or like uh, single uh, manufacturer, right? Um, all of the companies following the CCD standard are vulnerable because they use the same technology and they follow the standard and the standard describes to you CSMA, CA. Um, so yeah, that's why we decided not to uh, disclose this. And we tested 20 charging stations and same um, here, we are not disclosing which charging stations we tested. But what you can see is um, we tested different um, classes. We tested pretty expensive cars. We tested cars with high charging capacity, low charging capacity, and it didn't make any difference. The attack just worked. Um, uh, so we got a question in the reviews. If we tested all of the uh, possible combinations, so all of the eight cars with all of the 20 chargers, um, but that's just impossible. I mean, it's that this would would be first of all a lot of work, and also sometimes it's just you can't rent or get all of these cars at the same time. That's a bit difficult, and sometimes a charger is, is blocked and you can't go there because um, 
you need help from a project partner. And I will talk about this in, in a second. So I found this request of, oh, you should do like all possible combinations a bit difficult to, to implement. Um, and yeah, so this is just an uh, example of the different scenarios we, we tested. So uh, as I just mentioned, we had this drive-by where we had the antenna on the side of the car, the car is charging here and you just um, pass by and it is interrupted. And what is quite interesting, I think I haven't mentioned it actually, if you disrupt the charging, uh, it stays disrupted. The charger and the car uh, both go into an error state. So you drive by, it is disrupted. You need only, I would say around one to one and a half seconds. Sometimes not even this long because the car constantly sends uh, updates to the charger. And if the charger doesn't receive any updates, um, I guess for safety reasons, the the charging stops immediately. And so you go there, you disrupt and you can leave. And uh, the owner of the vehicle would need to go there, unplug, plug in again, authenticate the charging, and then it would continue. But you could also deny charging um, continuously by just emitting, constantly emitting the signal. And then we tried uh, just different settings. You have it here in the back of the car, someone is charging here, um, in the back of the car here, and the car is next to you or the victim, and then multiple multiple cars at once. Works like a charm, like you, you hit um, emit on your um, script and or enter and it just immediately knocks uh, off all of the uh, vehicles in proximity. Um, even long distance, so across um, this crossing, and the attacker was somewhere here and the victim here uh, just worked. I think I, um, I have a photo, I think, later. Um, but yeah, there are loads of challenges actually doing these real-world testing. So of course it's necessary, right? We we know okay in the lab it works, but we don't know how the the system, real world systems, um, actually behave under attack. It could be they are shielded. They actually use a different chip, not the one we had. Even though uh, the boards you saw earlier, they use um, a Qualcomm chip, and I think all of the vehicles and all of the chargers on the market right now use the Qualcomm chip. Um, I'm not aware of any other chip which is in production. Um, so we expected it to work, um, but we wanted to test it. So the first and important, most important thing I would say is experiments in the real world um, or in the real world environment involving the emission of electromagnetic waves must be carefully planned because you're emitting a signal which could interfere with uh, another um, communication. So you would need to check, is it actually possible to transmit us at this frequency? You can't just go and, and transmit um, at any given frequency, you might get into trouble. So you need to check also um, government regulations. So for example, in the UK, this would be Ofcom, uh, the Office for Communication, to check, can I transmit in this spectrum? Is there any communication? If there's a military communication going on in the spectrum, uh, I wouldn't recommend you to, to emit any signals there. Uh, you might get into real uh, trouble. So that's why it's important that you you carefully plan this and you collaborate with someone who knows this stuff. And that's why it was great to work with Arma Swiss on this. I mean, Arma Swiss is military, Swiss military. Um, so they helped us a lot and they made this uh, these experiments possible. Um, so yeah, uh, I would say for these specific um, experiments, it's important to have a partner. Um, yeah, th this is actually also a good point. It's sometimes hard to get uh, an industry partner, for example, right? Because you're trying to find a vulnerability in their system. Uh, they're not happy about this. Um, so it's relatively difficult to approach a company and say, yeah, we would try to break your car or your charger. Can we do it? Um, usually, yeah, they're not happy about this. Um, yeah, of course, the experiment shouldn't affect anyone else. So we um, made sure we are not affecting anyone. So if we went to a charging station, we talked to the charging station operator. Um, they knew about the experiments and then we we ensured that no one else was charging in, in close proximity. Um, yep. 
Oh yeah, that, that's again like the challenge I mentioned earlier. Running the experiment in all possible settings is just not possible. Um, and yeah, keep the transmission time to a minimum. This is another one. So we uh, basically, you, you need to ensure, do not spam the spectrum for five minutes constantly or for an hour. Uh, do your experiment quickly and then shut off the transmission just to reduce any interference. Right, so these are the meta questions. Um, I just want to go through them quickly. Uh, did you use uh, experimentation artifacts board from the community? No, uh, we are the first ones, as far as I know, working on this topic. So there was no artifact we could use. However, we will, or we actually made our uh, artifact already available yesterday. It's on GitHub. It's a Docker container, as I mentioned earlier. So if you want to try it, well, you can't really try it because you would need to try it on a public charger. Uh, or if you have the home plug green file evaluation boards, you could. I doubt you uh, you you have them. But um, yeah, anyways, the source code is available. Um, did you attempt to replicate or reproduce results? It's the same. Um, no, we didn't because there were no no results uh, on this before. Um, what can we learn from your metho methodology and your experience using your methodology? Uh, yeah, I hinted. Uh, at it already. So what we learned was PLC um, is quite, I mean, this kind of part of our attack, right? It's uh, vulnerable to crosstalk. It picks up the signals quite quite well. So um, that's why we isolated our setup with batteries and was, weren't powering it from the power sockets. Um, and another, another thing we learned is actually um, PLC is quite resistant to noise. So if you just have broadband caution wide noise, uh, good luck disrupting um, a charging session. This was initially our idea. Uh, we were like, okay, yeah, we just, it's an antenna. So we just emit noise and it will uh, be picked up and we will be able to disrupt. No, um, we did some tests. We had a massive amplifier, a hundred watt amplifier, uh, but we reduced output power to 20 watts and we were still not able from a meter away to disrupt um, the home plug green fire communication. So um, this was something we learned uh, from our experiments. Um, yeah, this was also, yeah, we didn't succeed just using noise. And so we were sitting down and looking uh, into more details and reading the standard and then coming up with broken wire. Um, yes. and. That's it. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to reach out or ask them now. Uh, as I said, um, there are more information on our website and our GitHub repository is also publicly available now and you can just uh, uh, clone the repository, um, do a Docker Compose build. And if you have a Lime SDR, you're ready to test it yourself. I have one real quick question. It just, it wasn't completely clear to me. What's the nature or format of that preamble? that's specified in the standard and what exactly is it you do to to inject right. that? Okay, so the preamble, um, so every data frame in Homeplug Green Phi uses a preamble because the preamble, um, it's a publicly known um, format. It's uh, it's used to find the start of a packet. So you, what the modem does, it has the preamble. So it's just a, a certain fixed pattern? Yes, exactly, and it does a correlation and basically, if it finds a correlation peak, um, it knows this is the start of a packet. And then, yeah. So you generate a signal that is able to basically emulate that that pattern. You can. We even um, just a cat inject one. that pattern. Oh. Yes, we even, we wanted to show that this attack is actually really simple. And literally, that's why I said uh, little to no digital signal processing knowledge is necessary because you can just capture from an ongoing charging communication. Oh the start of a packet, and then replay it. Right, so you don't even have to analyze it. No, nothing. Anything no, it's, it's just... Got uh, could I, um, Thank you. That's very helpful. So so I had a quick question. So I see that you have a CBE uh, affiliated with it, and that, that's good. Um, I'm wondering beyond that, I mean, who do you report this to? Do you go back to the standards body? I mean, somebody needs to fix this, right? Yeah, great question. Um, Actually, yeah, I forgot to mention this. We, in this case, we didn't notify the manufacturers. It sounds funny, but uh, there was a reason because it's a standards issue. Uh, we didn't want to cause any 
problems um, because we had this experience before that we went to a manufacturer and we said, look, um, there is a problem. And then the manufacturer said, yeah, but you shouldn't publish this because um, this is a standards issue and we are just following the standard, right? So why are you pointing at us now? And we wanted to prevent this situation. So we went to um, the standards committee and we notified them and we were working with them on countermeasures. Um, so yeah, this was roughly a year ago. So the embargo period ended yesterday. Um, yeah. So have they? Uh, do you have hope they're going to fix this anytime soon? Um, well, yeah, they're, of course. Of course, you know, in the, in, once it gets fixed in the standard, it still has takes time to get out into products, right? Yes. So it's a, let's say it's relatively hard to fix. Um, and especially looking at the rollout of charging stations currently and the number of electric vehicles produced every day, um, it's kind of hard to now roll out a fix um, to fix all already vulnerable or still vulnerable um, vehicles and chargers. Um, I, I can't tell you the exact timeline, but um, all I can say is they are working on it. I just wondered if I could, this is Craig Rodine from San Diego National Lab, and I was director of standards at ChargePoint before this. So my team knew about this and likewise raised the question. I'll just say, it, 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 it's not good enough to go to the standards bodies because those are basically industry actors and their reaction is not unlike what, what Se Sebastian just reflected, which is collectively they may not want it fixed. Now, the other side of it is if you look at the risk analysis, then I think that's a very important factor to bring out. It seems terrible. Um, we'll see how it's exploited in the field now. And unfortunately in cyber, sometimes you do this, you just have to wait and disclose as well as you can and wait for things to break. However, the, 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 the most probable damage will be one or two charging sessions stopping. Notice uh, Sebastian said, no equipment is broken. It, it immediately starts up again in the same state. This is not catastrophic in that respect. I'm not defending anybody here. I'm just saying we're, we're working through this in real time. Your, your question is a great one. We would love to have this fixed. I also want to emphasize what Sebastian just said. This is deeply embedded, and it's not a matter of a quick up firmware update or, or anything else. Also, almost all the vehicles and charging stations in the United States that do DC charging over this CCS standard, which is gaining and gaining momentum, are vulnerable to this problem. Thanks. Yeah, great. Thank you, Craig. Thank you. Well, yeah, smashing presentation. So, um, of CSMA C8, uh, yeah, it's a vulnerability in the nature of the medium, shared medium. So, um, I have a couple of questions and one half limerick. Um, first, did you test it with human bodies? You mentioned scattering, or you you only tested with line of sight? Since your all five scenarios had line of sight. Oh yeah, so um, we did plenty of tests. We uh, did some tests between floors, between walls. Yeah, to be I mean, it's it's um, you, of course you notice it because any medium uh, your wave needs to propagate through will attenuate your signal. Uh, but we are talking here about again like 10 milliwatts of power. Um, you can easily buy 10, 20 watt amplifiers now um, for a couple of hundred of, of uh, dollars. Um, I mean, even your Wi-Fi router probably has more output power than what yeah. we used. Uh, so yes, uh, non line of sight makes it more difficult, but definitely not impossible. Yeah, and um, I don't know details of the standard, but um, there is a giant cable going from the car to the charging station, right? Can anything be piggybacked as a cable on it? <laughs> I, I, as, a, as, a, as something that can be shielded, twisted, something? Um, yes, so I didn't want to bore you about like countermeasures, so that's why I removed the slide. Um, but so we also did some tests on countermeasures. So of course, the first one that comes into mind, it's electromagnetic uh, interference, right? Is shielding. But it, it's the same with the wall. You put something in between, you attenuate the signal, but, an, but it is an arms race. I just turn up the power a bit more. You need to add more shielding. I keep going uh, up with the power. And eventually you have a cable which is this thick. And then um, we're going back to what I mentioned earlier. 
the signal is not just coupling onto the cable, right? It can couple onto the PCB traces, it couples onto ground. So yeah, it's, um, it's not that easy. Look, they're just like, slide 21 is when we say we have to clean the data, you plan to clean the trunk of your car? Uh, sorry, say again? So we talked about cleaning data and cleaning repos, but if on slide 21? Oh, yeah, you, yeah. I mean, plan uh, to clean your car? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, um, for the next project, I promise that we will clean the, the trunk first. <laughs> that is. Um, yes, thank you for your talk. Um, so I know that at the hardware security lab at KTH, they're analyzing side channel attacks by analyzing these types of like electromagnetic magnetic signals. And one thing they can do, for example, is steal RSA keys by listening to this noise. So I was curious, like, is are there any is there anything worth worth stealing in this signal, or you not in this particular one. Can I steal someone's like account, the charging account, and then charge on their? Uh... Yes, yeah, so I would just refer you uh, to my colleague's paper, which was mm -hmm. published at Usenix 2019, which is called "Losing the Car Keys," uh, and actually he showed that it's possible to wirelessly eavesdrop on this communication, and you can get the keys, and you can join the home plug or the PLC network, and then you are just in the same network. I mean, you can just. Uh, communicate them with mm -hmm. like the car and the charger um, and so there is one technology which is uh, called uh, auto charge which transmits uh, the MAC address of uh, your charging controller from the vehicle to the charging station and this is used as a unique identifier to then uh, authorize your payment so you basically link your account to this MAC address um, so if I would steal this MAC address using uh, wireless eavesdropping I could just charge my car um, and you were paying for it. Okay. Um, I think we'll go ahead and wrap up. Um, I, I'll, just one other comment. I'll have to say I'd never heard of a uh, shooting break before, so I looked it up and that was uh, rather interesting. Actually, I did have one just real quick question. Um, glad to see that you've got your code out on, on Git. Uh, just, do you also have your data out there? Uh, no. Well, we don't have the data out there. Um, that's a good point. I mean, the code is there to just reproduce everything, um, but we don't have the data out there. That's a good point. Yeah, we will. We can make the data available. I mean, it's just. Um, yeah, I think I think given how difficult it is to create this data, it would be a, a big plus to the community if you could share that. Yeah, no, that's a good shout. Yep, thank you so much.